Before I joined the governor's office, where my job primarily is to keep him out of trouble, I had the opportunity to learn about the law and to learn about criminal justice from a number of vastly different, yet equally important, sources. The first, most obviously, was in law school, where students such as I was spend three years with their heads in their books, in the libraries, in the lecture halls, trying their best to internalize legal practice, legal theory, and legal history, working hard so we would understand these fundamental concepts, and so when we were called on in class, we wouldn't be embarrassed. All of us looking for that often elusive ability to see the bigger picture, to see the forest for the trees. And I began my legal career as a lawyer working in the military justice system. I served as both a prosecutor and a defense lawyer as an Army officer in the US Army JAG Corps. And I had an opportunity to travel the world serving commanders and individual soldiers who had put their liberty in my hands. And that included a year in Baghdad, Iraq, during the height of the Iraqi war, where my job was to defend those that were defending America. And before coming to the governor's office, I spent six years as a federal prosecutor, primarily prosecuting violent crimes, drug offenses, and people involved in gang activity people accused of committing some very serious offenses. And I was then, and I continue to be now, a big believer in our criminal justice system. I believe at its best, it can work incredibly properly and for justice. But as I settled into my role last year in the governor's office, I realized that despite three years in law school, a dozen years working in the criminal justice field, I had never been taught, at least in a formal sense, a single thing about one of the most important aspects of the criminal justice system. I had never been taught anything about clemency, about pardons, about commutations, about that unique and incredible ability to correct errors and to grant mercy well after the judicial process has run its course. The president of this country and all 50 governors have an immense and awesome power to do something incredibly extraordinary, to shorten sentences, to convert sentences, to literally let people out of prison. And yet not much dialogue is given to this. I practiced in the field for a dozen years, and I can tell you that people, as both prosecutors and defense lawyers, don't talk about it a great deal. And despite the fact that here in the state of Washington, we are constantly searching for reforms and ways to make changes, little reflection and review is given to the process, except for the, by the men and women who are incarcerated. I believe we need to bring the clemency process back into the criminal justice system in a more meaningful and thoughtful way. We need to remove it from that mysterious place it seems to exist and settle it more clearly back into the system. Now systems have always been important to me as a lawyer, as a practitioner, as a, think, a thinker generally. They help me process things so I can see them clearly. And I think part of that stemmed from my time in the military because one of the fundamental aspects of being a soldier is not only trusting in your leadership, but trusting in the system that's been put in place around you. Trusting the system will allow you not only to survive, but to thrive. And I thought about that a lot when, as a new lawyer, my first duty assignment was to go off to Army Airborne School to learn how to jump out of planes. And I will tell you that you have to put a lot of trust in the system when you allow folks to start pushing you out of airplanes. You have to trust that they packed your parachute well. And if they didn't pack the first one well, they packed your reserve well. You have to trust in the person in front of you and behind you so that when you stand up and you hook up and you shuffle to the door and you jump out, that it's all going to work in the way it's supposed to work. But as you evaluate the criminal justice system from the moment of an arrest 
to when someone is incarcerated and ends up in a facility such as this, we all must recognize two fundamental truths, truths that drive home the need for a more robust and thorough clemency process. And the first truth is this. Sometimes our criminal justice system absolutely fails us. Sometimes it fails us by incarcerating juveniles for an extended period of time. Sometimes it fails us by putting three strikes and you're out life sentences on offenders for comparatively minor offenses. Our system today struggles with how to deal with mental health problems that are permeating our communities and our prisons. And sometimes, on rare occasions, we incarcerate the innocent. So we all must recognize that sometimes our system, a system that I put a lot of faith in, fails us by facilitating injustices. And it fails not only the men and women that are incarcerated, but the rest of us. By putting our trust and faith in the system, we should demand that it work as best as it can. And while it does most of the time, sometimes it does not, and we must recognize that. The second fundamental truth that I believe calls for a greater demand than clemency is that not only does sometimes the system fails us, but sometimes those individuals who are incarcerated, they beat the system. And they beat the system not by getting off for crimes they in fact committed, but they beat it by overcoming the system itself, by not only surviving in the prisons, but by truly changing by learning, by reforming, by becoming educated, by making amends to their victims. They engage in a remarkable development for the day they came in to the person they are now. And we must recognize that and see that sometimes clemency is the only opportunity for justice and that some individuals do indeed deserve a second look at freedom. Now, clemency and pardons in the history of this world have not, only been, not always been viewed that way. There's actually a very fascinating history behind clemencies, not only in this country, but well predating it. The legal scholars who have looked at the clemency process have described it as not having a history of mercy, but a history of abuse. Kings in Europe used to regularly intervene in the criminal justice system at every stage of the process sometimes pardoning individuals before they were even indicted, sometimes pardoning them immediately after they were convicted or immediately after they were sentenced. Other kings would regularly sell their pardons to the highest bidder. You could literally buy your way out of prison once you were there if you could afford it. King James II was notorious for selling his pardons for pounds and pounds of sterling. He would keep half for himself and divide the rest between his mistresses. And if you couldn't afford it at the time, if you weren't sitting on a pile of cash, you could literally put your freedom on layaway. You could make installment payments to the king. And after you had paid enough, then he would let you out. Other kings have used the pardon and commutation process to populate their colonies and would let people out of jail to fight their wars. So your path to freedom was not by demonstrating the validity of your claim for justice, but by fighting and dying for the king. That's how clemencies used to be. And we've obviously come a long way since then. In the founding of this country, our founders had a fantastic debate about the proper role for the president to have when it came to clemency. And now it's had a huge role in the development of criminal law in this country. Concepts that we now take for granted, such as self-defense, not guilty by reasons of insanity, owe a lot of their legitimacy in our system, not to the judicial process, but to the clemency process, where attorneys raise those issues for the first time. How we now think about the mentally ill and juveniles in our system also owes a lot to the clemency process, where those ideas about who we should incarcerate and why were brought to the forefront outside of the courts, but in the clemency process. And despite this significant role that it's had in our communities, we have a real missed opportunity by not reassessing and reemphasizing this in our criminal justice system. And there are many ways that you can do this. And a lot of creative people will, could come up with creative ideas. There are two that I think about 
as I look at this issue. And the first is simply to talk about it again, to teach it in our law schools, to teach it to the lawyers who practice in the field on both sides of the aisle, to engage our offenders and talk to them about what it means to be one of those exceptional cases to get a pardon or a commutation from an executive. By working with victims and victims' families to ensure that their voices are being heard. Those are all things that are easier to do. One of the harder things to do is to create that social and political environment where the idea of giving someone who has committed a crime, the idea of giving them a second chance, is not viewed as foreign or as weak, but is viewed as wise and just. Because only by recognizing that our system does sometimes fail and that there are individuals who overcome the system, only then can we all have a system of criminal justice that we can be proud of. Thank you very much.